Uh, it is my honor now to introduce to you Mr. Luke Shebro. He is the director for the U.S. Army Mad Scientist Initiative, and I hope he'll spend a few moments on explaining uh, that title. <laughs> he previously worked as an intelligence specialist in the U.S. Navy. He has extensively worked in all source uh, intelligence, counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, and global security. He specializes in the analysis of alternative futures. He has a bachelor's degree, uh, BA in international studies from Old Dominion here in, in Virginia, and an MA in political science from Virginia Tech. His talk is entitled, Autonomous Intelligence, Eyes and Ears Are Everywhere. Welcome, Luke, thank you for attending. Joe, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's an absolute honor um, to, to be in this company of, of individuals speaking. Um, as, as a futures analyst, I actually cut my teeth really reading a lot of what Dan Flynn and company uh, were writing for a long time. So I, I appreciate everybody here and, and thank you for having me on. Um, so as, as Joe said, I'm the deputy director for the Army Mad Scientist Initiative, uh, which is a name that, that catches everybody's eye. Um, so what we are is a program with within Army Futures Command and U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command, so uh, a joint effort and venture where we want to explore the future operational environment, try to describe that environment by working with uh, tech, academia, industry, uh, and other government agencies. So we want to figure out um, the future, not trying to predict it, but rather describe that future operational environment so we can understand the characteristics and the context around it so that we can then help the Army build capabilities, formations, for structuring and readiness for that future fight. Uh, so joining today is, is again, just, just an absolute honor, uh, but I really wanted to start with this. So I have a coin that sits on my desk right now. Uh, and as you can see, there's, there's a certain Peanuts character uh, that is a part of that. And this is a coin from the Snoopy team. And when I was a young Intel analyst in the Navy uh, in 2007, being deployed in the Arabian Gulf, uh, I had to listen up as I was at Chow or in my rack for uh, the tactical action officer to call over what's called the 1MC or the, the loudspeaker, so to speak, on the ship of uh, TAO, away the Snoopy team away, port side contact. And so what that meant was, uh, for those of you not steeped in naval intelligence, is that uh, we had a visual contact of a surface vessel or subsurface vessel, uh, and it was time for us to run all the way up to the weather decks, uh, go with our photographer's mates, um, and go take pictures of this vessel. And then we would manually enter all the characteristics of that vessel into uh, reporting so that we could get it all the way back to the Office of Naval Intelligence. Uh, and through that, we maintained databases that allowed us to track merchant ships, track, uh, su su excuse me, subsurface and surface vessels all over the globe. And so this was a, a huge effort that took place across uh, destroyers, cruisers, frigates on those aircraft carriers. Uh, so Snoopy team was all over the place, um, but that was happening in 2007, and that was an extremely manual process. Um, and there's there's more advanced processes now, right? So uh, there's more existence of uh, automation of those forms, um, of getting the, the information more centralized and fused so that we can look at that intelligence and understand patterns of life um, and, and operational and deployment patterns for all those vessels. And there's also the inclusion now of more sources uh, like AIS, which are these systems that are, are rather uh, transponders that are required for these merchant vessels over, over a certain tonnage that allows us to track them all over the world. But what's next? What's the future? And that's what I think about a lot is, are we still going to be running the Snoopy team up to the weather decks to think about that? And I think not. But the point is, is that we've been kind of locked in this timeless competition. And in Mad Scientist, we've talked before a lot about timeless competitions. And those exist today. They just take different characteristics. Uh, and that's why we talk a lot about the the character of future warfare. And one of those timeless competitions, previously we've talked about protection versus access, strikers versus shielders. But in this instant, when I think about the intelligence community that I've belonged to since I was 
18 years old. Uh, that competition that's always been there is hiders versus finders. We have to find the intelligence. We have to find the assets, the resources in order to understand the common operational picture and give a clear understanding to our customers. Because honestly, in intelligence, we understand we are in a customer service business. And uh, intelligence drives operations and operations drive intelligence. And I think that point is going to be emphasized as we go into this next technological revolution even more than ever. And so if you look back and you think over time to initial uh, aerial surveillance measures from hot air balloons uh, to getting to biplanes to getting to high altitude spy planes uh, to the point of persistent stare that we think about with satellites now, we think about the character of camouflage that's changed over time uh, from camouflage netting to getting into inflatables and things like that. But what are we using now in terms of advanced materials? Um, obscuration in the electronic sense. So that timeless competition of hiders versus finders will perpetuate out into the future. So what does that mean in terms of autonomous systems? We start to think about what is happening right now, right around us in terms of autonomous systems that are advancing in very, very interesting ways. You can look at one of the prime examples right now of what just occurred uh, in the second Nagorno-Karabakh war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And what we saw was extensive use of UAS in a number of ways. So we kind of saw this advancement of UAS in, in the fires recon complex that we saw the Russians use somewhat in Syria, but as well in Eastern Ukraine, Crimea, and Donbass. So we saw that that extensive use of that uh, and a change a bit in the targeting cycle and the intelligence cycle. But I think and what I would project based on the trends that we're seeing and the advancements in technology is that that is going to proliferate widely. And we see the advancement from evolutionary uh, technological change into revolutionary. And so we'll start to see from semi-autonomous systems that are largely still remotely controlled right now into these intelligent autonomous systems. And there's really two ways to think about this. One is in the physical realm. And this is what we tend to focus on, materiel. So we start to think about things like in the maritime and air and land domain, and even in the space domain, these physical domains are very easy to visualize. We can think about it, we can see it. And we start to think about the proliferation of autonomous intelligence systems in both swarming um, or even just saturation levels. But when you look at those, those are physical objects and those, those are very tangible and things we think about. But the other side of the coin that we have to consider is a digital autonomy. Um, and there's going to be a growth in digital intelligent autonomous agents. And so we have to start to visualize not only in those physical domains, but in cyberspace as well. And within the metaverse, uh, which is kind of a world that we really don't understand yet. We're seeing expansion of the internet of things and the internet of everything, um, but almost this digital clone of the world that has a, a kind of nascent or ethereal feel to it. However, we're seeing the growth of non-fungible tokens and, and avatars and this idea of an entire virtual world within that metaverse. And so what kind of ISR capabilities, what kind of intelligence collection are we going to need in that metaverse? So we're going to have to look at intelligent autonomous systems across a physical and digital worlds. Now, what does that mean for intelligence though? So we're talking about autonomous systems and, and how it's going to play into our everyday life and our overall world. What are we going to be looking at for autonomy intelligence Why you're here today? We wanna look at how do we gather information in inaccessible areas? So one of those things that we look at right now um, is okay, we have satellite coverage, pretty global um, and, and without getting into classified details, we understand the limitations limitations that exist within that satellite coverage. And we understand that our adversaries are growing in their capabilities to either deter, degrade, deny, or disrupt those collection operations. So how can we start to use intelligent autonomous systems to gain access in those inaccessible areas? And some of that is going to rely upon autonomous systems that are intelligent enough and resilient enough to be able to operate without constant communications. So we're kind of used to this, this 
this pattern right now. Um, and I, I speak uh, directly, of course, of the DOD as well, um, used to operating with kind of assured communications minus, you know, normal technical details. Um, but we're going to be operating again in this space as degraded or disrupted or even denied. And so how can we use those autonomous systems? They're capable of operating on their own to collect in those unaccessible spaces because there will be no dark space. It's just a matter of, or, or denied space, but it's a matter of those gray spaces and how do we get into those? Um, and I'll talk a little bit further as we go along and how we change the paradigms in thinking about those. Another thing that we have to figure out is how do we overcome our adversaries capabilities? So as they have expanded collection capabilities, and this was something that Dean was just talking about recently, how do we deter that? And how do we disrupt their ability? And they're growing in their capabilities, not only for their own organic ISR capabilities, but being able to use the public spaces. As I talked previously about the Internet of Things and the Internet of Everything expansion of that, we're seeing it right now. So this device that you're carrying around right now is on you almost all the time, except for we have a lot of Intel community folks here. So as you're in the skiff, hopefully not. Um, but as we see expanding into our living rooms and all these other areas, uh, when you get to the Alexa devices, when you get to your kitchen devices now, we're going to have smart fridges, smart microwaves. Um, there's not too many things that are not going to be smart related. So as we expand, and we're looking at trillions of nano sensors and emitters within in the next 15 to 20 years. That is a ton of noise. And so how do we find our adversaries within that? How do they find us? And how do we obscure, obscurate so that we can blend into that environment as well? And a lot of that, again, comes down to deny, or excuse me, um, down to autonomous systems being able to do that. Because the human brain, the human cognition, and the amount, the bandwidth of humans that we have are not going to be able to keep up in that environment. Um, also, what are we going to do to protect intelligence community systems and assets? How are we going to be able to protect against um, the kind of things we're seeing right now, whether it's counter space capabilities, whether it's jamming? Uh, whether it's uh, what Dean, again, was talking about recently with the adversarial AI being used to exploit the seams within our algorithms, within our systems? Um, how are we going to use autonomous systems to defend against that? Because again, we're getting to the point where we're going past the speed of the human operator. And then also, what kind of autonomous cyber defenders are we looking for? So right now, it is extremely... A, a, a physical world that I talked about before. And when I talk to senior army leadership, um, they're, they're very comprehensive and understanding of, of space, of land, of maritime, of air. Um, these are tangible. These are things that they can feel in terms of, of that real world. And at the same time, uh, the cyber domain is still very, very nascent and ethereal and out there. It's hard to quantify. Um, and it kind of gets viewed a lot of times, especially in terms of warfare, as this um, this, this other space, the, this space that doesn't connect to the physical world. When in reality, um, we are becoming increasingly connected to every piece of it. For every phase of warfare, uh, we are connected to that cyber domain. And so again, we're going to have to introduce autonomous cyber defenders. And that's going to be a part of intelligence. And when we look at how we're going to protect our information, because a lot of the fight in the future is going to be over and for information, when we look at how we protect information, but also we look at validation for that information, we're going to need uh, autonomous cyber defenders and autonomous solutions to help us in those spaces. Now, what are the potential futures? What does that actually mean? What do we see uh, manifest? when it comes to those autonomous systems for intelligence. One is when we think about the physical entities or rather the physical platforms that will be created. We're going to have to look at platforms that are going to go all terrain. Um, 
some of that is going to be you see things like Boston Dynamics robots that are able to go over uh, these these different terrains, um, and some of that can be used in terms of biomimicry. So we don't we don't have to necessarily reinvent the wheel. Actually, evolution's done a good job of that for us. Uh, so what can we take from an octopus's ability to climb um, to create these autonomous systems that will be collectors for us? We're going to have to look at how we go subterranean in some cases because the adversary is going to con continue to come up with new ways to conceal and deceive uh, when it comes to that critical information that we're, we're trying to get. Additionally, we're going to have to look at stealthy systems. And again, going back to that autonomy level, when we get into the cutoff or degraded communications, that actually is going to work pretty well uh, when it comes to stealth. So we don't have those high levels of emitters. If you look at our intelligence collection right now um, in, in the open source uh, arena, um, you look at detection rates um, and, and what is attributable to us. And I think that we can advance quite a lot when we think about autonomous systems and being stealthy in collection. And then we have to look at constraints, um, persistent energy resilience when it comes to these. We're going to be asking these systems to fly, to crawl, to walk, um, to dig for a very long time. And so we're going to have to ask them to be energy or we're going to require them to be energy resilient without having to have these constant refuels, without having to have these low dwell times. And so we're going to be looking at what can we do in terms of renewable energy? Um, there, there might even be cases of low level nuclear energy being used, depending on the system. Um, and, and how do we continually and perpetually charge and use these uh, at the same time? And uh, as well, without having a drain on our further operational energy requirements. Um, so we're going to be fighting for a lot of that energy uh, by 2035. We're expected to see global uh, energy demand increase by 50%. So how do we get a chunk of that energy for our collection capabilities uh, without, without going overboard? And then um, I, I like to compare this other part to, um, it was said in the army for a little while that every soldier is a sensor, right? So that every soldier out there was able to collect and understand and help quantify the picture that existed on the ground, the real truth. Um, and then we kind of looked at every system as a sensor. So every system out there, whether it's designed for ISR or if it's actually designed for uh, combat maneuver, it's designed for sustainment, um, whatever the case may be, was a sensor. But actually, all those systems have to be looked at as a node, not as a sensor, as a node, as a part of the overall um design of system of systems overlaid, integrated, um, that work together. So this idea of a platform that is solely designated for sustainment, solely designated for medical operations, whatever the case may be, all those platforms are parts of nodes of an overlaid mesh peer-to-peer -peer system uh, and how we think about it. So we have to get out. We have to break the paradigms of how we normally think in this hierarchical intelligence system where we pass information uh, to more centralized locations for fusion. We're going to have to push it forward and we're going to have to use advanced battery technology, smart systems, edge processing at, at, at the edge there with increased microprocessing um, to come together and form these kind of redundant systems um, that can work and actually aggregate and disaggregate, hopefully at will, um, but also if, again, if you're operating in degraded, denied, disrupted environments. Um, so all that is fantastic, right? That's great. We're going to come up with these brilliant solutions and we're going to have autonomous systems all over the battlefield and all over a part of our everyday lives in the Intel community where we're trying to answer PIRs. Great. Uh, you guys, I solved it for you. Now you don't have to go through uh, the, the entirety of all this. But the truth is, it's a double-edged sword. So as we become increasingly reliant on these autonomous systems, it goes back again to what the discussion that was taking place towards the end of Dean's presentation, which is this idea that our adversaries are going to try to exploit that. They're going to try to get gain an understanding of how we use these systems and then try to disintegrate, not disintegrate, but disintegrate our operations when it comes to intelligence collection. Um, because again, they want to focus in the eyes and try to disrupt that understanding that we gain. 
So as we move forward, though, we're also going to see a lot of our processes and cycles transform. So I talked about a paradigm shift, and I think that's really important because we have to take a completely different look at what we're doing in the intelligence community. Um, those of us who have grown up in this intelligence community understand the intelligence cycle of collection, processing and exploitation, analysis and production, all the way down to dissemination. And let's start the whole gambit over again. But when we do that uh, and we think about autonomous systems, collecting, processing in some cases, exploiting in other cases, and then transmitting that data sometimes directly to the warfighter, directly to the decision maker without the intel analyst, um, then we're talking about a completely different cycle, a completely different process. So how do we do that? How do we make that cake differently? Um, so we have, to, we have to further change our perspective on how we collect intelligence, um, what drives that collection, what drives the requirements for for that um, and how are we going to answer our higher ups when it comes to executives who want answers quickly, um, but we want to make sure that the human is still part of that. And so that that's one thing I want to talk about at the end uh, or or closely. Humans are still a part of the system. So um, I, again, uh, will be accused of being a techno-optimist and talking about all these swarming, autonomous, semi-autonomous, smart systems that are integrated and they're gonna do all this collection um, and take, take so much off the analyst plate, but the humans are still a part of this. We need context, we need understanding. Humans are best uh, when they're still thinking about what's not there. Um, what are the false negatives? What are the false positives? How do we anticipate and add context when it comes to collection? And I think while we can use these autonomous systems to make us smarter, to make us faster, to make us more capable and unpredictable against our adversaries, the human is still a massive part of this. We still have a lot of questions to answer. We still have to figure out contextually how does the, how does the overall intelligence picture come together um, and if, if uh, Zach Tyson is probably on here right now, one, one thing we talk about so much is storytelling. We can't ask autonomous systems to storytell for us. Uh, and it's going to be very hard for commanders, for decision makers, for war fighters to think about the intelligence picture without us having that storytelling function. So I think it's, it's still critical to understand that this doesn't mean humans are going away. Analysts are not gone, but we can make analysts better. We can improve the intelligence community because I guarantee you our adversaries are working on it right now. Now, what is the Army doing about this? Um, I, I work for Army Futures Command. Um, there's a lot being done in terms of Team Ignite um, across Army Applications Lab, what's happening with the cross-functional teams. Um, but here's, here's kind of an overall vision that we like to think about. If you think about in the early 2020 time period, where, where we're at right now in 2021, um, kind of building up the soldier-born sensors. We're still at the soldier level. So if you look at the IVAS system uh, that's being created right now, you're seeing integration of augmented reality and virtual reality so that soldiers can start to see things around them. Well, systems are going to play a part in that too. So the intelligence systems feeding them information. And one, of, one of the things, one of the conversations I heard about earlier, and I've heard this for several years now, is this idea of like, do we really want to give our soldiers these heads up displays and just overwhelm them and swamp them with information? The point is not to give them an information overload. The point is to figure out how we can introduce autonomy that will allow them to get the most critical information at the best time so that all they get is what they need, um, not this overload of information. Because right now at the tactical level, your warfighters and your uh, commanders are looking at too much information. They're giving, get, they're getting overwhelmed with the amount of information that's coming to them when they really need to be able to focus on the tactical fight around them. So how do we build in autonomy to help them do that? Now, when you look into the midterm, getting into 2030, then we start looking at these unmanned swarming systems. So that's when we want to get into um, swarms that can do a lot of different things. And right now, we kind of tend to think about swarming as this 
purely offensive thing, right? We think of swarming as um, what you saw in the Houthi uh, attack on the uh, Saudi oil fields, um, which actually was mischaracterized as swarming. That was a saturation attack um, where you just saw a, a multitude of unmanned systems being used kind of at the same time. There wasn't that communication and again, aggregation um, taking place. But when we look in swarming in the future, that's kind of what people think about is either unmanned uh, combat area vehicles or they think about loitering munitions or these kind of um suicide drones um that cr are created by isis and, and violent extremist organizations and things like that but swarming in the future is going to look very different in terms of integrated systems you have to think about swarming in terms of defense um how we can obscure objectives uh and also how we can use it in terms of intelligence so collection uh how can we use it in terms of electronic warfare, um, there's a lot of ways that we can look at swarming systems. And so to think about it again, just in that offensive paradigm is a mistake. But when we look in the far term, then we get into autonomous recon systems um, that can loiter for really long time. Um, again, that persistent stare that we think about that allows us to get global coverage they can be a part of an integrated smart system to give us the uh, hopefully more of a ground truth. And then how do we integrate that further into these warrior suits? Um, this idea of, you know, we're not trying to create Iron Man, but what can we do for that hyper enabled operator um, that has all these all these functions that, that allow them to understand the battle space and interact in that battle space in a very different way than the way we think about it right now. And so that's the long range vision of what the Army is working on. But we see work being done um, between the Army AI Task Force, the National Robotics and Engineering Center, um, and everything that's taking place again through those cross-functional teams, through the capabilities development process, and everything Army Futures Command is driving towards is going to have an impact on the intelligence community. This isn't the military operating in some vacuum. Um, we, we in the defense intelligence community understand the relationship between uh, those other government agencies and, and the collection that takes place there and how critically important that relationship is. And honestly, it's only going to increase with time. Um, and so I apologize for how fast I've spoken today, um, but I, I think that this entire endeavor uh, is so critically important. We have to change the way we think about it. Our enemy, our, our, our enemies rather, our adversaries are doing that right now, and they are going to look to exploit every seam that we have. And so how can we build in resiliency in intelligence? How can we build in new capabilities? Uh, and, and we cannot afford to sit on the status quo. Um, so that's all I have really, but I'll, I'll open up to Q&A. All right, so uh, I'll go to the first question. We have a question from uh, Matthew Jonker. Uh, autonomous data gathering, machine learning are excellent, but when human in the loop is preferred, how do we ensure that communications and coordination across multiple agencies is ensured? Uh, and then do you foresee a time very shortly where human in the loop will no longer be viable? Um, to answer the second question, yes, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of expand on that. Um, but in terms of um, human in the loop being preferred, you know, how do, how do we ensure that communications and coordination um, is ensured? Uh, I would say let's create an office maybe like a director who would direct like all of national intelligence, like we could call it DNI. Uh, no, so so that's supposed to happen, right? That's that's supposed to happen across the community right now. And I think um, I, I don't have a silver bullet. I don't. But I think that we need to start exploring that right now, because actually there's not much of a difference between when we talk about human in the loop um, and human out of the loop, when it comes to sharing that information, if you introduce AI and ML solutions, to pardon my French, but a broke ass system, you're going to get a really fast broke ass system. So you're you're gonna you're gonna fail that much faster because we're not sharing the communications, and it becomes increasingly more important um, uh, human out of the loop though as well because when you talk about autonomous systems, we are talking about 
actualized mission command. Whatever you build into the parameters, into the algorithm, we like to think, sometimes we talk about AI as this general AI and this extremely intelligent system that's going to understand what we're asking of it. It will do exactly what you ask of it. But if you ask the wrong question, then you're going to get a terrible answer. So we have to think about right now, how do we break down the stovepipes and allow this information to occur? And I wish this was new. I wish this was a new problem. Them, but you can go back and read the 9-11 Commission report right now, and we had the same issues at that time. And sometimes it's not a matter of just sharing information. It's a matter of integrating information and intelligence. So we say, like, let's let's make sure we're sharing and it's going across, across the board and throughout the community. Great. That information maybe is getting there already. But how are we integrating it? Is it actually integrating into our processes, into our analyses, and into our systems? Um, so I think that's that's a really important question. Uh, as to your question of will we get to the point of being um, when when human in the loop is no longer viable? Um, this is this is a tough question, and we've we've talked about this a lot for mad scientists. Um, it's it's a technical question, it's an ethical question, it's a moral question. Um, it, there's there's a lot that goes into that. I would say, actually, I think human will come out of the loop in intelligence, autonomous systems. I don't mean intelligent autonomous systems. I mean autonomous intelligent systems. I think that will be one of the places, um, along with sustainment, where we take the human out of the loop pretty quickly. Um, and that's because there's far re uh, far less risk um, of civilian casualties, of um, mistakes being made, fratricide, things like that. Um, you kind of take away a lot more of that risk when you're just talking purely intelligence collection and sustainment in those areas. Um, but then that that becomes your slippery slope. So it's, it's dual use technology in so many ways, right? So we look at um, autonomy when it comes to transportation, uh, what's being done right now for for personal vehicles, for public transportation, uh, as we look at autonomy. And those are dual use technologies. We don't get to separate and say, oh, we're just developing this for self-driving cars. Well, what, what, is, a, what is a tank but a self-driving car uh, on a different chassis with, with all these capabilities? So we don't get to do that and separate that. So I think it's a slippery slope. Once we get to that point, um, I think I think it's going to be harder and harder to have a man in the loop, so to speak. Um, TX Hamez, who, who's written a lot uh, more so on coin and CT in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, but he's he's a fantastic writer and thinker um, for uh, National Defense University. Came in, spoke to us, and I think, uh, and I'm not saying that I agree with this entirely. This is not a position of the uh, Army Futures command. But I think it was really interesting. He talked about the idea behind um, man in the loop being morally disingenuous. So this idea that um, we, we like to say, we're going to keep a man in the loop and um, that's that's going to be safer. Um, when in actuality, when you get to the accuracy levels um, and you can ensure that you're going to have less U.S. troop deaths, you're going to have less civilian casualties and collateral damage uh, from an autonomous system, then it's morally just disingenuous for us to keep going uh, with this man in the loop and, and what frankly is becoming an antiquated idea of how we go. But we also have to be extremely careful um, in how we approach this. Uh, so Sean Steen, who we had on from OSD policy, uh, who, who knows DOD policy and autonomy back and forth, um, dispelled a lot of myths about, about what the, the DOD directive says, um, but also said basically, we don't want to get into a race to the bottom uh, uh, when it comes to ethics and morals with uh, China and Russia. So we need to we need to be extremely thoughtful, but we also need to move extremely quickly. Um, so that is a you know 30 minute answer to a, to a two minute question. Um, the next one, uh, let's see. How can we reason rigorously from an engineering perspective about the dependability on the behaviors and functions of joint cyber human systems? How do we get to the point of justifiable confidence in these systems before we come to rely on them for deterrence and war fighting? Um, let me see if I can answer this well. Uh, You'll trust it when you trust it. And, and I know that's that's overly simplistic, but the, I think we have to start thinking about how we integrate these systems 
both physical systems autonomously and those intelligent cyber defenders, how we start integrating them into our training and our operations. Training and doctrine, and, and maybe I, I'm, I'm biased because I've been at training doctor and command for a long time too, um, but we have to integrate these into training and doctrine because the way you train, um, and, and that applies to the intelligence community too, is the way you're going to practice. And you trust those systems because you train with them. Um, I, I was a user of anybody's familiar with a pretty old program now, um, Geeks M. So uh, Global Command and Control System Maritime um, used used a number of other intelligence systems that were popular in the mid 2000s, uh, whether it be Falcon View or things like that. Um, you, you learn to trust those systems. You know their ins and outs. You know the, the flaws that they have inherently. You know how to add context to them, um, being that they're tools. Well, these intelligence systems are going to be tools as well. And we have to get our analysts are used to using them um, in, in more of a lower consequence situation before it becomes critical. And so once they have an understanding of the limitations, the left and right boundaries, uh, and the potential pitfalls with those, the trust is going to increase. And, and again, I, I, I keep going back to Dean's conversation because there was great Q&A in that as well, um, in that you know, we trust we trust these things because we're used to using them and we understand. Um, and I think that the whole point of autonomy is these are going to be increasingly comfortable. And, and as we have a new generation of workforce coming in, um, they're going to be increasingly comfortable with those systems right now. So when you think about, again, going back to this cell phone, when I'm talking and I call Tony, um, I'm, I'm on the road, I call Tony, we're having a conversation about how amazing working in the Intel community is and how blessed we are. And so we're, we're driving along. I'm not hopping cell towers manually. I don't have to think about um, which cell tower I'm on or programming it or anything like that. It's happening automatically. It's not something generally that's going to come into your brain until you don't have service in that area or you're, or you're having interruptions. And so we have to start thinking about autonomous systems as becoming something that's that's going to become uh, a part of our lives. And we're, and we're getting more and more used to that fact um, as the days go on. So I don't know if that answers the question well, um, but that that's what I want to, to try and address. Um, given that artificial intelligence, autonomous systems, and unforeseen disruptive technologies will transform, I'm sorry, it's moving my thing all over, will transform espionage. What are some examples of what the IC is doing today to address these challenges from a policy perspective? Uh, what is a classic example of how the IC or individual agency leverages policy resource to identify disruptive tech, identify the source of disruption, and respond to it? Um, I don't think I have a good answer for this one. Um, in, in that I've been I've been in the the defense intelligence sector uh, for quite a while, um, but not not necessarily the larger. I see. Um, I, I think in terms of a policy perspective, I, I will add this. I will add my two cents uh, and, and perspective. I think that when we look at um, policy as it pertains to these disruptive texts, and I think um, increasingly smart systems are going to be a part of that, right? So you can't have you can't have an Alexa in a in a skiff. You can't have a smartwatch in a skiff. And so right now our whole policy is prohibition. That that that's it. So we'll just we'll just keep it out of this, um, and, and then it's not a problem. But I think COVID threw a big old wrench um, in a lot of those ideas. So we had to start, why are we doing this right now uh, virtually? Um, I think we would still have a very good virtual audience if we were sitting on a stage at, at Georgetown or uh, up in Bethesda or something like that. Um, but we're all here because and distributed uh, because of COVID. And so having to operate like that, and we're operating in a society that's going to continue to explore uh, remote working, remote learning and things like that, how do we adapt to that? How do we become um, more targeted in our approach to policies? 
because I can promise you the prohibition of these technologies is not going to work forever. There's going to come a point where we have to use them. So how do we how do we certify them uh, to be security wise safe? You know, um, how do we how do we incorporate it into our operations, but still be able to compartmentalize and do a lot of these different things? Um, I, th I think we have to start thinking right now about a lot of those policy changes um, and, and what that's going to mean in the future, because you are about to have, again, another workforce that's coming in uh, that is not going to be too keen on the fact that they can't use the latest and greatest tools because they got to work in a skiff that doesn't allow them to have all those things. And it's going to get worse. So right now we start thinking about wearables. And I think wearables are going to expand over the next 10 years um, as we see like Right now, you know, when you saw Google Glass come out, there was like people called glass holes because there's just these giant things um, that are obstructive and, and, you know, distracting and everything else. Um, and some of the early devices, like hopefully nobody from Amazon's listening, but like if you look at the Alexa glasses, um, they're basically just like, um, you know, for on demand music, like uh, on your on your glasses there. And it's really not nothing too integrated. But when we think about what's expanding in terms terms of augmented reality, when we get to that unobstructive wearables, um, we're, th these are going to be a thing of the past. This is not going to be something you want to carry around. Um, so at that point when processing um, technology is, is micro enough and we get to the point of uh, display technology being good enough, then we're going to go fully into this into this wearable category. And then how, how are you going to integrate that when that's, a, when that's the way you communicate? And then it gets even worse when you start thinking about the potential for embedded in the future, um, if we think about implants. So if we're doing, um, you know, what, what you think about right now in terms of what's happening with brain computer interface, um, what people might do um, as, as just civilians in implantables, how do you tell somebody they can't come work there because, you know, they have a chip in their wrist? Um, so we, we have to start thinking about um, protection versus access. Um, and again, I, I probably went on way too long for that. Um, what are our enemy's biggest weaknesses with regard to AI? Uh, for example, how does the extreme compartmentalization and difficulty in telling truth to power in foreign regimes affect their ability to utilize AI capabilities and insights? Um, I think that's a good question. Uh, they've, they've been surprisingly adept at figuring out how to utilize um, and weaponize that AI. And I think that um, what, what we can exploit um, is the idea of, of sunlight is a disinfectant for everything. So we have to continually be able to open up, um, open up the aperture or rather crack, a, use a crowbar to crack open the window on what they're actually doing um, to be able to exploit that. And, and their biggest weakness is, um, is that they rely on it almost solely in terms of suppression, right? So they're not they're not expanding opinions or attitudes, or um, they're not expanding their their collection is limited to suppression tactics. And so we have to think about how we can use our value system. So it sounds kind of cheesy, but um, how do we use that American value system um, and and the so called American uh, way of fighting war to exploit that? Um, um, but I think that's that's a complex question, and we really have to start looking at some of their weaknesses. Um, some I probably wouldn't talk about um, in in this medium, uh, but be be happy to talk to you all about uh, behind closed doors on that. Um, thoughts about novel approaches with low Earth orbit satellites uh, for cooperative and non-cooperative emitters, along with dynamic AIS and ADSB, uh, GNSS RF collections. Improvements include speed to orbit and cost. Both allow uh, secondary primes to enter the space heritage market. Um, requirements to orbit in six months, two, three million versus five to 10 years and a billion. Uh, is the IC moving to include those, those small sats and the like? Um, I can't speak for that. I, I would have to have an NRO rep 
up on here and I'm not sure we can even, not not sure we could even talk about it at this level um but I I think this is an extremely interesting space and not not to pun not intended but um this this is an extremely interesting space because if you look at the the star links that are getting ready to get launched um the overall congestion of space uh and the number of assets are going to be launched um it used to be limited to those huge state governments. And so thinking about Russia, China, United States, um, lo looking at that, um, th those large nation states. And now um, if you're a tiny nation state, but you can afford you know, $10,000 to throw a payload on a rocket going up, now you can launch your own constellation of CubeSats. Um, so I think, uh, it's, it's an interesting space and we have to start thinking about, um, the democratization of space and what is that going to mean for intelligence? And we're, we're already dealing with that. When we looked at, you know, Google earth, what I talk about being a young analyst again, Google earth was just kind of this novel thing. It was kind of neat, like, okay, maybe I could see my house or maybe we'd see this. Well, now we're talking about commercial imagery, um, that is, that is almost up to that military, um, IC level standard. Standard and and being available so widely across across the globe, um, so we have to start thinking again and changing changing our uh, perspective on access versus protection. Um, let's see. Oh, did you want me to go ahead and stop, Joe? All right, cool. All right, I've talked long enough. Uh, uh, these are these are fantastic Q&A. Um, and again, I, I'm just super grateful for you guys letting me come in and, and blather on for too long. Well, thank you, Luke. That was uh, a very uh, informative uh, um, real world view of the ubiquitous nature of data. Thank you.